Hello everyone, many thanks for attending this presentation. So my name is uh, Gregory Payne, I'm from the University of Edinburgh and today I'm going to talk to you about experimental considerations and testing for extreme loads on tidal turbine. Here is an overview of the content of my presentation. I'll start by giving you some background on the project uh, then I'll move on to the uh, impact test part of the project so I won't spend too much time on that because I've made a previous presentation on that before um, I'll spend most of the time talking about uh, the turbine model uh, its design and manufacturing and assembly and that's because I spent uh, most of the last two years working on that so I thought it was fair to de dedicate most of that presentation to that part and I'll finish off with the tank testing that um, was carried out a few weeks ago and with the preliminary results from that tank testing. Now moving on to a project background. So this project is part of an EPSRC funded project called XMED which investigates extreme loads on wave and tidal energy converter. So the project is led by the University of Manchester and Peter Stansby is the principal investigator. So as part of my work, I've uh, worked in close collaboration with the University of Manchester and mainly uh, Tim Stallard. At Edinburgh University level, the principal investigator is Tom Bruce and uh, the job of the, the contribution of the University of Edinburgh to that project uh, is the design, manufacturing and testing of uh, tidal turbine experimental model. Okay, so now in terms of the goals of the project, um, the main goal is to investigate extreme loads due to combined currents uh, and wave loads. Also to look at the wake of the, the turbine and also to investigate uh, impact loads on the turbine. So I'm now going to briefly talk about uh, impact tests. So as I mentioned earlier, I don't want to spend too much time on that part because I've already dedicated another presentation uh, um, and to that subject. So originally at the beginning of the, of the project, the idea was to use one single uh, turbine model to investigate both hydrodynamic loads, so due to wave and turbulences, and impact loads. So for me, um, my, my gut feeling was that the impact loads would be much higher than the load than the hydrodynamic loads and that it wouldn't necessarily be possible to use one single model uh, to measure both uh, but at the time that was just an intuition and i needed you know hard data um, um, uh, to take that decision so i decided to design a simplified version of uh, the turbine to, uh, to, uh, to have an idea of the magnitude of the, of the impact loads and this is what you can see on, uh, on this slide. So what we have here, we have an, uh, an arm uh, made of aluminium which is basically over engineered compared to, the, compared to a blade but what's interesting is that this arm has the same uh, moment of inertia um, with respect to this axis as the whole rotor of the turbine and that inertia also include the uh, water added inertia. So uh, at the tip of that, um, uh, that arm you have an impact sensor, a piezoelectric impact sensor. Uh, here you've got the, the target supposed to, supposed to represent um, the hardest part of uh, a marine animal. So you can either hit on the plastic side here, which so that I think this is made this is made of HDPE plastic, or on the other side it's covered uh, by a three millimeters uh, uh, rubber skin, which is supposed to represent you know this uh, skin of the animal, and you can also vary uh, the mass of uh, that target uh, using those uh, weights here. Um, the way the arm is driven. I didn't want to uh, use an expensive motor, so what I did is that I used a torsion spring that you can see uh, you can see here, and the idea is that you can load the um, so sorry wind up the um, uh, the arm 
and then release it. So for the first 180 degrees, the arm is accelerated by the, the spring. And the last uh, 90 degrees, the system is freewheeling. And basically, you can set the pretension of the spring uh, to achieve uh, the velocity you want uh, before impact. Uh, so basically, in a nutshell, this is pretty much like a giant mousetrap or uh, a golf machine, uh, which, uh, depending on the way you look at it. Um, so this, um, yeah, I mentioned the impact um, sensor uh, here at the tip, and I'm also recording the velocity uh, of the uh, of of the shaft of of the um, of the um, of the rotor, and in order to do that, uh, I use um, an old motor which I use as a taco generator that you can see here. Now let's look uh, at the rig in action. So believe it or not, uh, this is science. Um, so. I've done quite a few tests, uh, you know, with uh, different uh, velocity uh, pr uh, prior to impact velocity and different uh, mass of the um, of the target, and also uh, impacting on the rubber side or on the plastic side. Let's now look at the results. Um, so on that graph, um, you have on the x-axis the RPM prior to impact, and on the y-axis the maximum impact force uh, in Newton. And so you get data for uh, different target mass and different target material. So the main conclusion uh, from that graph is that the um, impact force is mainly influenced by uh, the velocity prior to impact and the um, nature of the material of the target. The actual uh, mass of the target has little impact. <laughs> <That's>, yeah, <laughs> has actually little bearing. Sorry, on the uh, on the impact force. Um, so the bottom line that is that from those results, um, the uh, maximum uh, impact force was two order of magnitude higher than the maximum hydrodynamic loads predicted by uh, Bledelman momentum. So from that, it was quite clear that it wasn't possible to use uh, the same model the same turbine model uh, to carry the impact test on one hand and the hydrodynamic test on the other hand. And the reason for that is that if you design um, a model which is with its instrumentation sensitive enough uh, um, to capture the, uh, the hydrodynamic loads, uh, then that same model would be, or at least its instrumentation, would be pretty much broken, uh, overloaded uh, by the, the impact test and the other around so basically if you design your model to be able to cope with the um, the, the impact test um, then its sensitivity sensitivity of its instrumentation would be too low uh, to properly record um, uh, the loads from the uh, uh, induced by the waves and by the turbulence so let's now move on to the turbine model by starting with the blade design requirements so the idea here was to design uh, blades so that the CP and CT curves versus tip speed ratio would be similar to that of the full scale device. So we completely freed ourselves from the um, geometric scaling, pure geometric scaling, which in a way, at least for blade, wouldn't really work because the Reynolds numbers are very different. And so the idea was to uh, design blade which would in terms of geometry would probably be very different from the full scale ones but which would produce uh, CP and uh, CT curves similar to that of the full scale device. Another requirement was to make sure that the, the um, tip uh, deflection of the blade was less than 2% of the radius and this was mainly motivated by the fact that uh, Manchester University wanted to use those experimental data to validate their CFD model and the CFD model didn't, mod didn't take into account a blade deflection so we wanted to have a blade deflection as low as possible. Now moving on to the blade design itself. So the first thing I needed was an estimate of the load experienced uh, by the blades. So in order to get that I've used a blade element momentum and then I need to carry out a structural analysis uh, to assess the level of stress, um, the deflection, and also to carry out a vibration analysis. So I knew that I would have to go through 
quite a large number of designs. So I wanted a structural analysis method which would be quite quick. So instead of using a full finite three-dimensional finite element analysis from the beginning, I decided to use uh, beam theory. So you can see here one blade design which has been discretized in uh, about think, 80 to 90 uh, blade sections. So for each of those sections, I used the blade element momentum uh, to get an estimate of the load applied to each section. And then uh, for each section, I also calculated the beam property of that section. And I did that uh, using the software uh, Abacus. So this made, made it possible to uh, go through um, complete blade design in less than an hour. So within an hour, I would have loads uh, from blade element momentum and um, uh, deflection and vibration analysis. Once uh, I was happy uh, with, uh, with the design from uh, beam theory, I cross-checked the results using a more in-depth uh, finite element analysis using a SOLIDWORKS simulation. So this is a view of the FEA analysis of the, of the final blade design. And in the end, in terms of deflection, there was uh, hardly any difference, I think uh, a couple of percent, uh, between what was predicted by the beam theory and what was predicted by um, uh, the FEA analysis. Now looking at the rest of the turbine model. So this is a um, CAD view of the, of the model. So it's 1.2 meter in diameter. Now we're looking at a section view of the model. So at the root of each blade, there's a root bending moment sensor to measure the root bending moment in the streamwise direction. The signal conditioning electronic of each of the sensors is located uh, in a small waterproof um, box in the nose of the turbine. So this is basically just the uh, amplifier for the strain gauge bridge. Strain gauge bridge. Um, now just Downstream of the turbine hub, there's a torque and thrust transducer. And then in red here, you've got the, the shaft. Around the shaft, you have a slip ring, basically, to get the signal from all the sensors which are in a, a rotating um, frame of reference into a fixed one. Uh, obviously, you have uh, two cylindrical bearings on uh, each end of the shaft. And at the back, uh, there's a brushless motor which was used here to simulate um, uh, the generator. I'll come back uh, in more details uh, to that motor in a moment. So, but here, what's interesting to see is that the actual seal is here. So that's the shaft seal here. So everything which is on the left of that seal is in the wet. So here, the, all this is in the wet. And inside here, it's in the dry. So the idea of putting the shaft seal here, so basically um, downstream of the torque and thrust inducer, was that the, um, all the friction associated with the shaft, uh, shaft seals and bearings uh, do not affect the measurement uh, from the torque and thrust transducer. Now, here is a picture of um, basically the torque and thrust transducer and the slip ring. So here we're not talking about a serene model anymore. This is, uh, this is the actual uh, metal part. So the torque rating of the torque and th thrust transducer is 100 newton meters, and the thrust rating is um, 1,300 newtons. Here is now a close-up of the shaft and its front bearing, at its front bearing level. So on the, on the left here, you have the torque and thrust transducer, and here you have the shaft. So as I mentioned earlier, everything which is on that side here is in the wet, and everything on that side here is in the dry. So you can see that the, um, the shaft is locally uh, hollow. So you have the cable here coming out of the shaft. So that's the cable carrying out the signal from the torque and thrust inducer, but also from the root bending uh, moment sensor, which are on the hub of the turbine. So the cable comes here. So th that part of the cable is actually rotating. 
uh, it is connected to the rotating part of the slip ring, which eventually uh, connects through, uh, basically through the slip ring uh, to the outer part of the slip ring and then goes on into the, into the tower. Looking into more details into the design of the root bending moment sensor, so that's an overview of the turbine with um, the root bending moment uh, sensor towards the nose, a close-up of those. So you can see here the hub in black, each of the different of the three uh, root bending moment sensor here, and the open box uh, containing um, the um, electronic amplifying uh, the signal from the um, strand gauge bridge, which is uh, loc which are located here, here, and here. Now the work on the, the on the. Um, root bending moment sensor was done in collaboration with a company called Applied Measurements. So on my side, I did uh, the design of the uh, actual uh, flexures uh, using um, finite element analysis. Then I designed the flexure, uh, did the drawing for the flexures themselves, got them uh, manufacturers, manufactured, and then sent them over to Applied Measurements for them to uh, fit them with uh, strain gauges, um, waterproof the overall um, uh, strain gauge and carry out the, the calibration. So the rating of those uh, root bending moment sensor is uh, 70 Newton meters. To record the signals from all those sensors I needed some uh, data acquisition hardware so I've used um, a national instrument uh, compact DAC that you can see uh, here. So for most uh, of the signal, instead of using voltage signals, I use current signal because it's less sensitive to um, electromagnetic inter interference, which I was expecting a lot of from the, from the motor and especially from its drive. Um, so also on the, on the other side here, you can see these are various power supplies uh, to power the, the different part of the, uh, of the instrumentation. Okay, now looking at the motor itself, so I didn't know much uh, about, um, about uh, motor and power electronics, so it was an interesting project, an interesting learning curve for me. So first of all, I wanted to use, uh, to use direct drive, and given the fairly high level of torque that was uh, predicted by the blade element momentum, I soon realized that I couldn't do with a low voltage motor, and I had to go for a three-phase 400 volt uh, motor. So for that, um, I found a company called uh, Alxen, a French company called Alxen, uh, which um, produces motor with quite a high level of torque uh, with a small, within a small, uh, uh, small form factor, especially small, small diameter, which was really important here because we were trying uh, to keep the um, nacelle diameter within 10% of the overall um, uh, rotor diameter. And so that's, uh, so what I've used is a brushless permanent magnet servo motor. And that motor is uh, fitted with a resolver, which also gives me uh, indication, real-time indication of uh, angular position of the rotor. And from that I can derive uh, velocity. So obviously when you start to deal with that kind of motor, uh, it's not just a matter of, you know, plugging it to a socket, you need, uh, you need a drive. Uh, which I bought from the, the, cell com the same company. So Alxion is also a distributor from uh, Moog um, Power Electronics. And, but I also discovered that uh, with this kind of setup, uh, just the drive is not, is, is, is not enough. So you need a uh, whole sorts of you know, breakers and uh, power supplies and filters uh, when you work with uh, this kind of drive and this kind of voltage. So you have all the all the breakers, uh, all the breakers here, uh, power supplies here, and so we needed to do um, basically a proper electrical cabinet, and so for that, um, Rodrigo Martinez, who's a PhD student working with me, was very very helpful because he had a lot of experience with uh, with making electrical cabinets, whereas for me it was a first. So here, as I mentioned, you, know, you have the drive itself. Underneath this metal part here, you have the uh, dump resistor or brake resistor, because obviously the um, 
motor would work most of the time as a generator, so it needed some way to dissipate uh, the energy produced. And at the top here, you have some sort of remote control with all the emergency uh, button in case something goes wrong. Okay, so now moving on to the manufacturing. So this is an overview of the different parts uh, before anodizing. So most of them were done either by the university workshop or by Edmund Designs or by a company called uh, a local um, um, manufacturing company called uh, Penland Precision Engineering. Okay, now one of the um, critical parts of the turbine uh, were uh, the blades. So the blades were made from uh, solid aluminium from CNC. Uh, we are using CNC and this was done by the local uh, workshop of the School of Engineering. So the way it works that I design using CAD software a blade profile. I pass that on to the, to the workshop and they um, uh, they, they transformed, they, they converted that into a, a G-code input for the CNC uh, mill. And so that part was quite, was quite, was quite critical because when you do the first half of the, um, of the blade, this is not too complicated because the blade itself is supported by metal underneath. However, when you turn it to the other side, you've got nothing to support it from underneath. So originally I wanted to use some uh, special wax, uh, but this was quite uh, complex because you needed to put your part, you need to take the part away from the, um, from the milling machine, put it into an oven to a specific uh, temperature and also in the meantime also warm up your wax at an other and a different specific temperature and then pour it over, you would have liquid going in the side. So. I think, well, that would have been the ideal tool, but that was quite complicated and I was really uh, impressed by the workshop, you know, I was, that they came up with the idea of using um, poly uh, insulating polyurethane, polyurethane foam. So at the beginning, I wasn't, too, uh, I wasn't too optimistic about that, but, you know, credit to them. So um, that's uh, Steve here and uh, Rab, who, uh, who did a really good job. So basically, they just got it to work and the... Um, the, um, the outcome was was this so that's the the blade just after machining on both sides so you still have some uh, little ridges you can hardly uh, see them on the, um, on the on the surface but basically that's that's an artifact of the of the milling machine so uh, then what I did um, I uh, polished uh, polished each blade by hand so first with a sandpaper of uh, various grades and eventually with a um, with a polishing wheel here uh, to get rid of all the all the little ridges. And, uh, the final uh, uh, the final product was 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 this. So I was I was pretty happy with it because it was it looked uh, looked pretty good. It was very smooth. Uh, so this uh, this is a uh, pictures taken just before uh, the blade was sent for uh, for anodizing. Okay, so after that we had to move on to the to the commissioning, which was carried out at uh, Flowwave TT in Edinburgh. So um, uh, here you have uh, Tom Davy from Flowwave and um, Jeffrey Steno from Flowwave as well. Um, Peter uh, McCurry, uh, um, colleague from, uh, from Artemis where I used to work, uh, came over on a Saturday um, to help us with, the, uh, with uh, tuning the, um, the drive for the motor or basically tuning the motor, drive, motor and drive uh, combination for, the, um, for this application. And that's the um, tur turbine being mounted on the floor of uh, Flowwave. So that's a really nice feature of Flowwave that you can actually bring up the floor and do all your mounting uh, in the dry and then lower the floor back into the water uh, for your testing. And if something goes wrong within 10 minutes, you can bring the floor back up and do all your maintenance uh, in the dry. After that, we moved on to, uh, to Ifremer in the north of France. Uh, to do the, the testing itself. So, so Ifram Air is basically a large uh, flow channel, flow and wave channel. So it's about four meters wide and two meters deep. Um, so they don't have a movable floor, so it was a bit more complicated um, uh, to mount the, um, uh, the turbine. So here the turbine is mounted on a structure 
uh, which was provided by them. So it's about uh, 700 kilos steel structure, with uh, in which includes um, a six degrees of freedom load cell here, on which the um, the tower of the turbine was mounted. So here, because they don't have that much headroom for the crane, we needed to uh, we couldn't um, mount the three blades um, in the dry. So we had to mount the last blade from this little uh, from this little uh, dinghy, and uh, one thing they didn't tell us is that actually there was a little leak in the dinghy, so it was already quite difficult. And after a while, I realized, you know, like uh, uh, we realized that our trousers were um, were a bit wet, and they say, "Ah, oh, no, no, don't worry, don't worry. It's just a, just a little leak on the um, uh, on the boat. You know, extra motivation for you to uh, to get that done quickly uh, before." Before it gets too wet, so the test um, for the so we spent two weeks uh, at uh, Ifromer. So Rodrigo and myself. So Rodrigo is here, uh, and and myself here. And then we, for two two uh, two days of those two weeks, uh, Tim Stallard from uh, Manchester University uh, came came down. It was really helpful because he was um, processing pretty much in real time the data we we're producing from the from the turbine. Okay, so here again you can see the, um, uh, the Ephraimer basin, so with wave uh, sun from that side. Uh, what's also quite nice with uh, Ephraimer is that uh, on one of the sides you, you have a glass here, uh, from which uh, that uh, video was taken. Um, so what you see uh, here is the, is the laser um, uh, LD, uh, LDV, which allowed us to, uh, to measure velocity quite accurately to uh, characterize the wake of the turbine. Okay, another interesting feature of the um, Inframer facility is that uh, you can run it with or without the flow conditioning, and so that gives you uh, two different uh, levels of turbulence intensity. So the video you can see here is without the flow conditioning. So you get uh, a turbulence level of about uh, 12%. And if you put the um, flow conditioning, uh, you go down to about uh, 3% of turbulence uh, intensity. And because the point here of uh, those tests was really to um, assess the extreme loads uh, due to wave and uh, Turbulences. It was interesting for it was important for us to be able to um, run those tests in uh, 12 uh, 12 percent uh, turbulence. Okay, and you can all we could also uh, run waves. So basically, here you have the um, the turbine uh, undergoing not only a current but also a wave. Same thing from uh, as seen from the window, so you can really see the, um, the water level going up and down, uh, just here. Now, here are some preliminary results of those tests at Ephraimer. So they're really hot of the, of the press, and so I say, yeah, they're really preliminary. So what we have here is the um, C, CT and CP curves. So CT here and CP here, plotted against uh, tip speed ratio on the x-axis here and here. And so this turbine characterization was uh, carried out for the two level of turbulence intensity, so three percent for the um, blue crosses and um, well I wrote 15 I think it's a bit closer to uh, 12 percent for the red circles and obviously uh, what you can see is that uh, both uh, CP and CT are a bit lower for a higher turbulence intensity which is what you'd expect because of the because the turbulence are a bit uh, when the turbulence are a bit higher you don't have exactly you know the right always the right angle of attack on the on the on the blades now also this is just a snapshot of what was recorded um, with the sensor so that's shown one time series but there's a lot of that and that's that's still what I need to work on what I need to uh, the, the data I need to exploit so this is here on the top graph RPM plotted against uh, time in second. Then we have torque uh, in Newton meters. 
then we have thrust in Newton, then we have um, uh, rota uh, rotor uh, position, so it's absolute positions in degrees, and at the bottom you have the root bending moment sensor in the streamwise direction for uh, the three, uh, three blades. So if we zoom in a bit, uh, that's what we have here. So a little bit of variation on the RPM, uh, quite a bit of variation on the torque, on thrust. So uh, here you've got the rotor position. Obviously it's uh, periodic, so that's why it goes through 360 again, again and again. And here you can see the different patterns um, on the... Um, on the root bending uh, moment sensor and because there's a three of them obviously uh, you can see there's about a phase shift of about 120 degrees uh, between uh, between the three different signals so now what's left to be done so as i mentioned earlier well more uh, data processing so looking at uh, the extreme load due to turbulences extreme load um, due to waves uh, We'd like to do also more tank testing at uh, Flow Wave TT, so hopefully in September or, or October, so early um, early autumn. And instead of finishing by uh, asking uh, for question, uh, what I'll do is uh, asking the audience uh, a question. So one of the small problem we've had with that uh, with those tests, mainly with that uh, model, is uh, some level of uh, instability of the. Um, of the of the well combination of uh, rotor motor, we think uh, I think it's an issue with the the control system, and I've asked several people uh, who've worked with the motor, so mainly um, Ozan from uh, Edinburgh Uni and uh, Peter McCurry from um, from Artemis. Um, but here is what it does. Uh, here's the video. So it works normally, and then it becomes a bit more jerky, and eventually, yeah, this is what we get here. So that's pretty unstable. That that's actually pretty nasty for the sensor. So we we discovered that this actually uh, eventually overloaded um, the root bending moment sensor um, because the basically the dynamic variation here are very uh, very very high. So as I said, we think uh, it's an issue with the um, control of the motor, which is control in uh, in speed but uh, we haven't been able to solve it yet so if you have any suggestions um, 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 i would be happy to hear it so that's it for uh, for this presentation uh, if you have uh, any query or if you have an answer to some of the questions please feel free to contact me by email at the email shown on that slide thanks very much this production is brought to you by the university of edinburgh